Before I dive in and tell a little more of this Beatles story, which we began on last week's episode about side one, kind of the lead up to the most of the Abbey Road sessions in the summer of 1969. Before I get into the side two, the continuation of that story, I want to give some bibliographical credit here. I mentioned it on last week's episode. I've read a lot about this album. I'm sure we all have. I've been reading about it most of my life. I'm sure you guys all have too. But I pulled a lot of details from this guy, Scott Fryman's lecture series called Deconstructing the Beatles. It's admirably exhaustive. It's entertaining. He has long pieces, audiovisual tidbits, pictures, isolated tracks, all that kind of stuff, different takes. And he does it for almost, I think all the Beatles albums are up on his website. So check out Deconstructing the Beatles. If you're curious, credit where credit's due for a lot of these details. So where we left off, the four lads from Liverpool had taken some time apart after a few recording sessions in the early part of 1969, but now they've agreed to record a new record together with George Martin at Abbey Road Studios, known as EMI at the time, which we talked about. And if you want more of the story uh, leading up to those sessions or how they came to that decision, or perhaps most important, what the heck these millionaires were even fighting about, again, go back an episode if you haven't listened to our side one episode yet. So basically all of July and August 1969 are booked at Abbey Road. The first week, however, and we already mentioned this last week, but Lennon is out because he has a car accident while he's on vacation in Scotland. He needs like 17 stitches. It's semi-serious, I guess. And Yoko, who's actually pregnant with Sean at the time, hurts her back. But his old pals, the Beatles, are like, fuck it, let's start without him, right? <laughs> now, uh, so you can see maybe where the... <laughs> They both they're both smacked up on heroin. They'll be fine. The pain's gonna go away real fast. <laughs> to, to to be honest, I kind of tried to dig into this. I couldn't get a beat on whether this was Lennon's suggestion because he does seem kind of checked out of the Beatles at the moment. He seems the least interested. And if you recall, when Paul was approaching George Martin about getting together for another record, even George Martin kind of knew that he's like, even does John want to do this? Like he's the one I'm really wondering about. Or if well, it was the Beatles just saying, you know what, we're not waiting for you anymore. Let's just start. The thing also that I found very interesting, and you mentioned it in the previous episode, is that Give Peace a Chance had been released relatively recently. And I found it to be very interesting that George Harrison took that as permission to record All Things Must Pass. Mm -hmm. That was his permission to say, oh, somebody put out a solo project. That means I get to do that now, too. Green light. Because he had said something to the effect of, I've already written enough Beatles songs for the next 10 years worth of Beatles albums saying it in a snarky way. Like I only get one or two songs on an album. So I already have enough songs to be on the next 10 Beatles albums if I want to. And then he kind of was like, you know what? Fuck this. Instead of waiting 10 years to put all these songs out, I can just make my own album. I got 10 more old Brown shoes right here, guys. I can't believe you guys are digging into this gold. I think in many ways, All Things Must Pass is the most successful post Beatles Beatles record. He just sort of leans into a sound. He has an all star crew. It has a it has a vibe that doesn't really appear in the Beatles catalog like in that way. It's got Eric Crapton, who Phil loves. Listen, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to post Beatles. Let's not get waylaid here like John did in Scotland. So either way, he's not there for the beginning of the sessions, and it probably creates some resentment, regardless of whose decision it was. Right. And they do work on some songs without Lennon there, like Here Comes the Sun and Her Majesty, for instance, right? And at this point, before Lennon even shows up, they've decided that side two is going to be this long medley. So when Lennon does rejoin, he brings in Yoko, who's bedridden. We already mentioned this last week. They bring a hospital bed into the studio, which is already ridiculous. He requests a microphone. She's laying down, mind you. And the microphone is hanging above her face so that she could comment on the proceedings and his nickname for you. I'm imagining the guy from Breaking Bad with a yeah. bell that he's just. Yeah. Every no, 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 <laughs> she no, just no, screams no, into no, it every once in a no, while. No, no, seriously, seriously, seriously. Let me, let me, let me recontextualize this a little. You're at work, and someone's significant other who does not work at your company is in the room in a hospital bed, dictating to the whole team what should be going on based on what she's hearing through like a fucking can attached to a string (laughs) holy shit please don't tell me you can't imagine elon musk doing this though (laughs) and i think it even goes a level further than that (laughs) because you're at work 
but it's also like you're like a civil engineer or something. You have a very highly specific set of skills that allows you to do this work. And some fucking joker is just like, hey, maybe we should do something different. You're like, you don't know what you're fucking talking about. You have no talent whatsoever in this field. I need to add more context because then you also get a window into their personal behind closed doors, what should stay behind closed doors relationship when your coworker is calling his significant other mother. That is, yeah. You don't you don't need to know that. You don't want to know that. But here's the thing. Here's the here's the flip side is that it might have been seen as an improvement by McCartney and Harrison, because keep in mind, in the get back sessions, she's sitting in a chair touching John's thigh and you know could be touching Paul's thigh at the same time as they are trying to work as a band and present new songs, and things like that. So at that's least just, in this case, she has wrong. a little bit of distance. That's we do, we we talked about that on the get back uh on the let it be episode is that that circle of musicians is like a sacred thing you don't get to be in the fucking circle you can be in the room even that's kind of annoying but there is a clear delineation of people playing music and people not playing music and you don't get to sit in the circle if you're not participating in the music you know i I don't feel as harshly as you do about that tom but it does make me actually think of something slightly different but on point here which is like has anybody ever been at a concert and somebody in the crowd has like a percussion instrument and they're like playing along tambourine ladies that bring oh my god that's that's the one man that's the one that'll ruin it for everyone so if you're listening and you're part two doing this this is this is stop stop this is a bad this is a bad move well, for anyone who hasn't, uh, I'm sure everyone's a much, you're very much aware of the Yoko is niche of like this whole situation. But watch that Chuck Berry video where My God, she's yeah, actually on video. stage, where yeah. she's not just there as a like faux collaborative member, where she's on stage with like, you know, two of the greatest rock musicians or blues, rock blues, whatever you want to call it, musicians of all time, and is just allowed to scream into the microphone. Like, it just that, tells you all you need to know. That Bill Burr breakdown is the funniest yeah. thing I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, it's pretty it's, good. It's awesome. They, they, stop, they focus on his eyes, and he's just like, am I going to have to choke a bitch? Like, what's going on? <laughs> Drunk. Wait, before we move on, though, it really, you really shouldn't bring a tambourine to a concert <laughs> play from the crowd. There's a lot saying. of things you shouldn't bring to a concert. Tambourine is definitely one of them, though. I you also shouldn't what... bring a bed for your wife to a recording Pregnant session. Pregnant wife. Good call. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Do you, think they, do you think they banged on that bed? When, oh. like, everybody else left the studio? Oh, nah, man. He's all smacked up. Dude, I don't yeah, want to talk about banging Yoko. Yeah. I, I can't. <laughs> it's too late at night. Really okay, so John gets there <laughs> with Yoko, and McCartney catches him up on all the stuff they've been working on, which is a lot of, a lot of side A is now complete basically. And he pitches in the side two medley, which George Martin is also fully on board for and excited about. And they tell him, oh, it's like a symphony. It's going to be like Sergeant Peppers. Lennon is completely unimpressed. Of and they're like, well, h- well, how about you add your song to it? He's like, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's fair. <laughs> Spotty results, uh, questionable results maybe, but we'll get into that. They're calling it the long one as they're recording it they don't really have clarity on exactly what it's going to be yet there's fragments of things going back to like we already said the white album days snippets of songs august rolls around and they've actually done a lot of the tracking they haven't done any of the sequencing yet and august rolls around and at this point it's mostly overdubs for the record but i wanted to highlight a few key days moments in august 1969 in our favorite segment abbey roadside to buy the numbers Okay, let's talk about some numbers from August. We're gonna make this into a little countdown. First number I wanna throw out to you is 38. That's the size of the orchestra that rolls in for overdubs on August 15th. We're talking 12 violins, four violas, four cellos, a string bass, three trumpets, two clarinets, two alto flutes, two regular flutes, two piccolos, four other horns. I don't even know what that means. One trombone. Those, and get this the other horns are the ones i want to know more about <laughs> french horn bugle i don't know but, the, <laughs> but here's but the kicker is there's one bass trombone mm. well there could have been two bass trombones if they moved yoko out of the way and <laughs> the <laughs> exactly I, seriously though what sonically is the difference on a recording between 12 violin players and Six players. Could anybody tell the difference tell there? George Martin. He's just padding the budget. It's got George it. Martin is the guy. He owns like a you know like a right. string production why, company. That's why they don't make any money. 
<laughs> okay. Well, maybe it's like it, it, you know, in the work world, if you don't use the budget, then like finance you lose falls it, right? Back. He's got it. So you're just like, hey, we gotta, we gotta spend it. Here. Thing, you know, or he's just trying to. John doesn't want to multi-track. Didn't we cover this? And I think <laughs> no, I believe, <laughs> I believe at this point they have signed that next lucrative record deal that they were looking to do with you know, Alan Klein helped them do it. And yes, yeah, so maybe they're getting a little more spendy right now. It's possible. Well, I think George Martin's pulling the uh whatever the name of was of the studio that recorded that Slipknot first album where they're just like, ah, well, you know, it's a it's a per member fee here. And you're like, listen, you got it, you got the more than 10 violin player tax that we kind of put on Bulk there. So pricing at that point, which actually goes up, up yeah, surprisingly. Yeah. I, I can confidently project that that is the first time Slipknot and the, and the Beatles have ever been. <laughs> uh, actually, the Beatles came up on the Slipknot episode. You'd know that if you listen to our show, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to keep the listeners on their toes here. <laughs> I mean, hitting a keg with a baseball bat and hitting an anvil with Max Anvil, right? Hour, they're kind of similar. Yeah. It's not that okay. Let's say an anger. Let's get, no, let's anger. get the next Just number. Kidding. The next number is 10. This is a little side journey. Hours that this podcast is going to go. 10 is, the, <laughs> 10 is the number of minutes the police agreed to stop traffic to take the iconic cover photo. Even the Beatles can't catch a real break at that freaking intersection they walked out there at like 10 a.m on august 8th to talk this uh, to take this photo and I, we're going to get into other things they did in the lead up to that but one thing i thought was funny is they considered calling the record everest at one point which was the brand of cigarettes that engineer jeff emrick was smoking and then they kind of briefly talked about traveling to the Himalayas to take the photo. And then everyone's like, I don't want to do that. Let's just go outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they go from like... With Tom's solo album, uh, Camel Unfiltered 100s. <laughs> so like la laziness really saves the day and creates the yeah. most iconic album cover of all time. They really, well, also, that's, that's quite a swing from like, let's go to the least accessible place in the world to let's walk yeah, out our no, front door 25 dude, you feet. Don't, you don't want to take those kind of like, alcohol cigarette and heroin habits to tibet like that's just not <laughs> yeah. where you, you don't want to no. take it you know, acclimate it's yourself not... to the elevation yeah. for six weeks <laughs> yeah yeah it's like sure. dude, just try out like seventeen thousand feet as like a starting point just <laughs> good luck okay speaking of that photo session the next number i want to throw out to you is six that is the total number of photographs they snapped in that session and you can find these other shots online and what, what surprised me was they really don't seem to have the clearest idea for what this is even going to be. Three shots are them walking back the other direction. A couple of them have Paul wearing sandals. Uh, they chose the only one that really captures them in full stride, seemingly by accident. Like they just feel like they're just naturally walking across the street. He snaps six photos and they happen to get this really good one. The are best there, album cover of all time. Are, are there like some out of focus photos like what they're even they must have run more film than that right uh, uh, six were the only one maybe six were the only negatives they decided to print but the other ones are not good that's what i'm trying to tell you yeah, so you can't know, see their faces on, uh, or they don't have arrangements they yeah have they, they don't have the stride thing going on it's just it seemed really strange to me and we should point out to listeners who might not know that they're out in front of the studio and they're walking away from the studio implication that they knew about was that they're leaving the studio sort of you know, maybe for the last time. It is the last time, right? I think for the longest time when I was a kid, I thought they were walking into the studio, but that's not the case. Oh yeah. I can yeah. see that. Is there as any it... indication as to why Paul's barefoot? That led to the whole Paul is dead thing, right? right. Is the, are there, what is it? The undertaker, the, the priest Paul is dead thing is so right. fun, by the way. I mean, it's, completely it's awesome. Bonkers. It goes back to like mystery tour, right? And it insinuates that they're well, like, a body double yeah, yeah right so, so let's let's talk about it because yeah, i have a little piece on that the album cover helped popularize the myth the myth being that that paul had died sometime in the past and been replaced by a stand-in paul and that the other beatles the other beatles felt so guilty about it that they were dropping clues for instance in the photograph the abbey road photograph he's got a cigarette in his right hand but he's left-handed and, and one of the license plates also in the photograph says 28 if as yep. in 
28 if Paul was still alive, except really he was 27 at this time. But, you know, these are details. <laughs> and like <laughs> Robert Stack walking out with his trench coat for Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah. The idea that the you background. would find someone who looks exactly like Paul McCartney that is actually slightly better at songwriting and performing <laughs> these songs, yeah. you know, be like because he's maturing his musician is completely yeah. insane. It turns out that this body double is a real fucking taskmaster. Fucking ace who hired this guy. All he does is write happy songs about serial killers. <laughs> okay, let's keep it going here. The next number I want to throw out to you is three. That's the number of Beatles songs covered by other artists at the Woodstock Festival taking place in this month, August 15th to 18th in New York, 1969. Now the Beatles were invited to attend, but decided not to. However, during the show, Richie Havens does Here Come the Sun, Here Comes the Sun. Joe Cocker does With a Little Help from My Friends and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young sings Blackbird. Strong argument right here for the fact that the group is still on top in terms of influence and artistry. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Great call. And last near meaningless piece of trivia. Number one, the number of Beatles songs that starts on a C sharp minor chord. Any guesses? Only Beatles song that starts on a C sharp minor chord? It's because. It is because. I yes. I did a deep dive on this today. We'll, we'll talk more later. <laughs> I got to be honest. I read that. I attempted to fact check it. I did not go through every song in the Beatles book. So Beatles nerds, <laughs> if you want to prove me wrong, feel free. But that stat is out there. It is because they have other songs in E major, we should point out. And they obviously use that chord. They change keys a lot. But anyway. Okay. That, that ends... August 1969, the time of Woodstock, the time of cultural change, the time of the Manson murders, the time of Altamont, just about. And speaking of generation defining events, we made a new show called Song Battle, the best of the 90s. <laughs> that is a hell of a transition. Yeah, well done. Was, uh, yeah. It's pretty ace. Right, right, I, gotta say. Yeah. I thought you were going to do a you never give me your money transition into the Patreon <laughs> thing. Oh, but... that would have been nice. <laughs> We love every one of you for listening to this podcast. We see the numbers grow every week. You guys write to us. We appreciate it. Our mailing list grows. Our Patreon community has been growing. The response has been amazing. And we've started doing bonus content over there. So we have a full round of our new show, Song Battle, the best of the 90s, where we all come with contender songs and we argue and tell some of the history behind the songs and argue about which one is the best. And we've already scheduled... I believe since we're taping this a little bit early, the first episode may already be out. The next edition of Song Battle, entitled March Radness, the best of the 80s. You can get all that as bonus content over on Patreon. It's five bucks a month. Buy us a beer. We're going to continue to bring you this weekly show for free every single week. And we love you no matter how you want to support us. Thank you. Should we be informing our audience that we actually recorded last week's episode and this week's episode all in one sitting? And so we're going to be like four hours into a fucking podcast recording by <laughs> well, the time we start losing it on this the episode. Delirium fact understand. I can yeah, already feel myself funny. getting loopier. You guys are getting funnier. Oh, yeah. Dude, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a couple beers in, <laughs> loosening it up. I definitely poured some whiskey on that. Okay. <laughs> Let's all right, let's keep it moving over to the song. So they're starting to think about sequencing now. And apparently the mood is somewhat happy, maybe in part because they, they kind of know it might be the last time they're going to be together. And they very purposely, as we're going to talk about with the songs, they end both sides very abruptly. The last official session ever, the last official session for the album, they don't know it's going to be the last session ever, but it ends up being the last one ever was August 25th, where three of the Beatles showed up to mix side one. Guess where John was instead of being at the mixing yeah. session? He No, he was going through heroin withdrawal at the time, so oh, kind of the opposite wow. of that. Mm. Mm. Now, flash forward just a little bit. We'll just talk about the aftermath, and then we'll get into the songs. On September 14th, Lennon says in an interview that though he's played with others, if he wanted to make more music, he'd still choose the Beatles. And he confidently says they're going to be back in the studio in January of 1970 when the In Progress documentary the Get Back documentary was set to come out. Little that doesn't happen, as we know. Uh, I wanted to bring up a couple other pieces of trivia about the album as we go along. Um, sorry, I got these a little out of order. 
But on that very same day, Lennon says that complimentary thing about his bandmates. He gets invited to this rock and roll revival festival in Toronto with Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis. And he impulsively not only agrees to attend, but offers to perform. So to do that, he hastily assembles the Plastic Ono Band, even though they've already released that single. There's no real band there yet, right? And they perform in Toronto. And this is actually later, much later, released as Live Peace Toronto 1969. Pretty much right after that show, he announces, I'm quitting the Beatles. So John comes back, he tells his bandmates, they're like, okay, no big deal. George quit once, Ringo quit once. They always come back. Let's not freak out here. Let's just keep this quiet. Let's see what happens. John goes off, as he says he's going to do, records another song with Ringo in the session, Eric Crafton. It's called Cold Turkey, and it is also That's credited. That's a stinker. That's a hard stinker. <laughs> it's, well, it's, he's, one of the reasons he's mad is because the Beatles rejected it already. And yes, spoiler alert, it's sense. not that good. As they should. It's I mean, not they're that kicking, good. They're, they're, kicking out like, they're kicking out some good Harrison songs at this point. Right, exactly. And there are a few other things to do in Beatleland before this official rap, but they're never really together for a session. You know, they do like a Christmas fan club release. They do a little promo video where they never actually appear together. And there's some overdubs on Let It Be, but John's definitely not there. And I don't think two of them or more than two of them ever get in the same room at the same time again to record until the 90s when the anthology stuff comes out. So October 1st, 1969, the record hits the shelves, but the group is effectively done, even though the press does not know it yet. It does quite well. I assume you guys know that. It was number one in the UK for 17 weeks. It was number one in the US for 11 weeks. It sold 4 million copies between September and December of that year. Jesus wow, Christ, 4 million lot. copies in four months? Crazy. And, and at least Ooh. a month of those are pre-orders. And uh, it won a Grammy for Best Engineered Album. Which, okay. Huh. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, it's well engineered. There's no denying yeah. it. Absolutely. What won the best? What won album of the year for a Grammy? That's a great question. I do not know. Maybe you can look that up while I well, tell my. Right now. What was my man's name who engineered it? Jeff Emmerich. Emmerich, yeah. What did he I, for 1969? The 70 awards, though, would have awarded to 1969. Awards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look up here. Da, 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 da. I'll don't don't wait on me. I just wanted to mention two other pieces of trivia here before we get into the song, get into the songs <laughs> considered titles. I mentioned Everest. They also considered the title inclinations. They considered turnips four in the bar and all good children go to heaven. These were working titles for Abbey Road. By the way, yeah. the winner uh, was blood, sweat and tears self titled album. For all right. Yeah. I mean, I'm and, not familiar with it, but uh, can't be better than this, right? Yeah, the winner for the, the single of the year, by the way, Phil, single of the year. You're going to love this one. Aquarius, let the sun shine in. Oh, God, I hate that shit. <laughs> fifth dimension? <laughs> yeah, fifth dimension. Yes. Good pull, Adam. Yeah, Thank you. Man. It's just obnoxious. One more thing I wanted to mention. They, they clearly chose the right title for the album might have been influenced by the cover photo that we mentioned which was sort of born of laziness they couldn't really get together they didn't want to travel let's just take the photo outside heck let's just call it abbey road as we said in the last episode later later the studio was renamed abbey road sort of to capitalize on that but that wouldn't happen for some years maybe the lesson here though is that like necessity is the mother of invention sure you know i i also will point out an interesting thing that i had never thought about before I have one of the first 100,000 copies of the White Album ever printed. I bought it for $2 at an estate sale. It was a Damn. fantastic find. I also got like original releases of Led Zeppelin 1 and Thriller and a bunch of uh, and animals. and But it says recorded at EMI on that. And it never occurred to me that EMI is fucking Abbey Road. Oh, wow. That's cool. That was a learning for me, too. Two last little things I wanted to mention about this side. One, we've already alluded to it. And listen, I think John Lennon, pretty much throughout the 70s, was pretty crabby about the Beatles. I don't know if they were getting maybe a little closer to a reconciliation when he died. But he said on the medley, even later, I could never stand that kind of rock opera on the B-side. It's crap. 
Now, one last piece of trivia for you. Since we're breaking this up, Adam, I'd like it to be show. added to the record that Adam made a face, like a like a begrudged face. <laughs> yeah, I made a like, face like, too. Like, Fuck like, you, John Lennon. What's what is wrong with this? you? I'm telling uh, you though. I don't I, realize you wrote Sergeant Pepper. Or... I think the context is that he was real adversarial through a period, and so you get a lot of really bitchy comments and even some songwriting barbs. I'm sure we'll get into it on another episode. But the last thing I wanted to mention is that. When they originally sequenced the album, they were going to have the sides reversed. Side one was going to be the medley. Yeah. And the album, the entire album, was going to end with the white noise abrupt ending of I Want You, She's So Heavy. So great call on swapping that, boys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is a great call. Although my first instinct is like, what the fuck? But like, as I'm thinking about it now, I'm like, yeah, I, I can it, see some logic there. But I'm I, glad I, they didn't I, do that. I also see how like here comes the sun seems like a beautiful opener and it is a beautiful opener for the second side of the record right like you again like you're back to the record right you're back to that like 22 minute format that is like sort of just like I don't know like a pretty appropriate length for the human attention span 